My name is Dylan Edwards. I'm the incoming Executive Dean of the Faculty of Medicine and Health from February next year. Um, I'm also, at the present time, I'm the Interim Director of the Genome Analysis Centre across the road, so an organisation that deals in big data, but data of a different sort, DNA sequence analysis. So um, this is the fifth in a series of public lectures on the theme of big data, big questions. And today's event is concerned with how big data can help the NHS and what the UK can learn from Estonia, a pioneer of e-government. The series is part of the activities of the Economic and Social Research Council funded Business and Local Government Data Research Centre, which is a collaboration between the universities of Essex, East Anglia, Kent and the London School of Economics. Today, we will have two speakers, eventually, uh, who will speak for about 20 minutes or 25 minutes each, and then we'll be having questions from the floor. And um, well, uh, we'll then finish around, hopefully, about 8.30. So today's speakers are Will Cavendish, Director General of Innovation, Growth and Technology in the UK Department of Health. I'll introduce him more fully when he actually arrives here uh, uh, from, from the train. He's on his way. And our second speaker is Ain Eviksu, Deputy Secretary General for E-Services and Innovation, the Estonian Ministry of Social Affairs. So Ain is, uh, uh, as I've said, he's di Deputy Director General for E-Services and Innovation at the Ministry of Social Affairs, uh, where he's Chief Innovation and Digital Officer leading E-Society and Digital Services. He's Chairman of the Supervisory Board of the Estonian E-Health Foundation and Chair of the National E-Health Task Force. He also lectures at Tallinn University of Technology. He was previously Director of the Health Policy Programme at the Praxis Centre for Policy Studies and an independent, not-for-profit not think tank. He also worked as a Product Development Consultant on Healthcare Information and was Head of the Public Health Department in the Ministry of Social Affairs. Ain, welcome, and we look forward to hearing your presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Honoured to be here, first time in East Anglia. I know already, after being here like two hours, this won't be my last time. Um, and I hope that uh, I can deliver you something um, of my own personal experience, but also from my country. I'm trained as a medical doctor, currently devoted myself to bring uh, more intelligent healthcare to people. Um, <clears throat> and the country I come from, I don't know how many of you know what Estonia is. It's about 1.3 million people, so one and a half of uh, Norfolk. Um, but it's uh, about the size of a Denmark or uh, of the Netherlands, um, so it's uh, not that densely populated. Um, it has a university which was established in 1632 with a medical faculty in it. Um, uh, and the Tartu is the town where the university with a medical faculty is situated. Uh, um, based on the numbers and the description on, uh, in the internet, similar to uh, Norwich, uh, um, small town with, uh, where academic atmosphere is uh, very important. What else about Estonia? Um, you might have heard uh, Arvo Pärt, a composer, contemporary composer, which has been recorded most during recent decades, or the uh, football goalkeeper Mark Poom. Uh, so uh, we're proud of him too. Um, well, um, the GDP of Estonia is um, about 26,000 uh, US dollars uh, on purchasing power parity as compared to about 40,000 of UK. But I looked that the uh, Norfolk County is pretty much the same in PPP terms uh, as, um, as Estonia. Um, and then uh, Skype was initially uh, invented, the, the engineers, the four engineers that built Skype uh, uh, were all Estonians, even though the, the salesmen were again from, from Denmark. And later on, uh, Grabcat, um, uh, which is um, mm, uh, engineers 
uh, basically social network and most recently TransferWise also was uh, developed by Estonia. So there, there is some, something about technology uh, in, in Estonia and in Estonians. It might be because Estonia regained its independence in 1991. Pretty much the same year when the internet, as we know it today, started moving outside of academic uh, facilities. And um, so, and that was 50 years of occupation. So Estonians wanted to leave back everything that was related to that old times. And we embraced anything, everything that came with this new uh, order and, and, and new opportunities. And the internet was part of it. So that might explain some of the things why we have embraced uh, things um, quicker than, than others. Um, I will start from health uh, and health system. I'm, I have studied, as, as mentioned, a lot of health systems and worked with several governments uh, around the globe. And uh, the cost inflation has been like a standard part of health systems. So, well, we assume we get better quality, that's why it's reasonable to spend more money. Um, there isn't no more money. Uh, the, the biggest burden to public debts in Europe are health and social care costs. So these are just some figures from Estonia, um, but uh, I know uh, not that much different numbers could be acquired from any other European country as well. Second thing is that the old innovation engine, so um, to take an example how drugs are developed, it has out of steam, it is out of steam, uh, because no new molecules are coming out and the investments in, in that uh, way, which usually takes a uh, billion dollars and uh, 15 years to develop one molecule. Um, so change is needed, so there is urgent need for change, and this was the report that was uh, presented to the, the biggest engine of new drug development uh, that the country, uh, United States. And the world, it has changed already. These are the things we can't uh, change anymore. So uh, there are technologies, and there are many technologies, and, and uh, they have now ripened and they are converging. So um, when people were complaining that, okay, we uh, sequenced our genome uh, uh, in 2000 and by 2010, uh, none of the promises, none real promises that were first uh, delivered uh, that uh, genome will change healthcare, well, the information technology wasn't ready for that, to use and to make sense of that information. Now we are living in a totally different era. And people, you know, just take a sugary water with some colorants in it. So uh, it is personalized. People want things to be personally for them, not anymore, um, just a standard product. And the data, it, it is big, it, it really is. So I, I started, uh, well, th there, are, uh, there is some confusion about how much data actually there is uh, in, in healthcare. So, um, uh, well, this is uh, 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 the most recent numbers I could get. Uh, uh, and, um, well, I don't know how many of you are data scientists, but this 153 exabytes. Exabyte is, um, I think, one a number I got was that five exabyte uh, is about the amount of information that all the world's mankind has ever been speaking. So all the words that have been spoken throughout the history of mankind are five uh, exabytes. So there is more information than we can actually capture. And that means the, the, the size is big, uh, it uh, increases at ever uh, uh, increasing uh, pace and uh, there are many kinds of that. Just recently we had a visitor from uh, um, 
uh, a sense lab from MIT in the United States and, and, and he had crazy idea of linking, uh, I'm going to tell a little bit later on about the um, data bank that we have uh, about 5% of the Estonian population genome linked with nine different healthcare databases and to link mobile positioning data and environmental data and then uh, analyze how environment affects uh, people's health. So there are not uh, actually limits to what you can combine with, uh, um, with data. Uh, of course, people who spend money, who, who, who invest, uh, they may be biased uh, to their, uh, towards an investment, but uh, Vinod Kosla uh, two years ago has delivered, um, I suggest to watch this, this video, uh, people who are trained as, as physicians might get annoyed uh, because Vinod Kosla is a bit uh, mm, um, aggressive towards uh, not using technology and uh, data processing and analysis if we actually have already a lot of evidence that, for instance, uh, at Kaiser Permanente, which is one of the health systems in the United States, um, has just by using data analyst uh, and uh, uh, doing analysis about how physicians use and prescribe uh, lipid lowering drugs. And uh, out of that analysis, they designed new ways of uh, uh, patient pathways and also uh, care guidelines and uh, reduced mortality by 45% in that group of patients. So when I showed you initially that the pace of new drugs is, uh, um, that are coming out of uh, pharmaceutical companies is slowing down, I think over, there have been 20, 30 years since we have had drugs that are actually capable of lowering uh, mortality by uh, double digit numbers. Um, so what then is that uh, big data can uh, deliver? Um, this is a study made by several uh, organizations. Uh, the current slide comes from uh, McKinsey. And uh, the five areas where they see for health systems the benefit uh, would be delivered is that first uh, we can help people behave better. We can tell them uh, and we can design uh, advice to them uh, and also through uh, technology help them to get fast feedback to their activities uh, so that um, the uh, uh, diseases either are prevented in the first place or uh, for secondary prevention uh, they don't deteriorate as quickly as uh, they might otherwise. Second is that uh, Healthcare has developed into a maze of very specialized activities. And um, uh, I don't know if, uh, I hope you haven't had uh, the reason to find your way in the health system, finding the right physician or building uh, a, a rational flow of uh, um, activities and advice in a health system. Uh, and uh, there is a lot of waste and uh, there is uh, too little coordination. Uh, that is also an area where big data can help and streamline the activities of different uh, currently uh, isolated uh, activities. Um, well, another uh, component of that is that uh, there is too much care taking place uh, in hospitals in very high risk and uh, high cost uh, environments, whereas actually a lot of activities could be done either at the primary care level uh, or uh, increasingly also by uh, people themselves. There is um, one estimate that uh, for a chronic di diabetic patient, about 4% um, of the decisions that directly affect her health are 
done by physicians. And 96% of the everyday decisions that affect the health and the outcome um, are made by the individuals themselves. Well, it is not either or. It doesn't mean that physicians are useless. They are making very, very important decisions. But uh, what uh, eventually uh, uh, decides the outcome is how the clinical decisions and the individual patient decisions are, are uh, combined. So shifting care to the right setting is what, again, big data can help a lot. And uh, um, also, uh, health systems have been built for providing care. So a um, few years ago, uh, uh, when I um, consulted one of the big hospitals in Estonia about their quality management system, and, uh, and we started uh, with an interviews uh, with all the managers of um, clinical centers uh, and um, there was old, uh, very uh, well-known uh, uh, surgeon in one of the surgical departments and when I asked, so how would you describe quality in your area? What, what comes first to your mind? And then he said, well, well the reason that I'm here is a sign of quality, because if I wasn't here, the quality would be much worse. Well, eventually we ended up that, okay, he can do certain things that junior doctors can't do. Uh, so we actually managed to build quite a, quite a decent uh, quality management system. But the idea that uh, we are uh, expecting that providing service, service unit, is what healthcare is built for, is increasingly more difficult to, to manage because there are more than one option always uh, and then also uh, it has been shown that uh, it does not deliver always the best possible value. So orientating health systems towards value generation rather than providing services um, is uh, good. A friend of mine working as a GP um, in Netherlands uh, said once that um, he practices prescribing uh, patients just uh, two weeks of uh, doing nothing but uh, some good exercise and, and uh, um, so basically vacation. Uh, this is not the traditional way what a patient would expect from a, from a doctor. And the, the final point is also important. Uh, we heard uh, that uh, uh, in this university and I would think in all universities who have some medical activities, uh, thinking new uh, um, ways to treat people is what big data is used for. So from a theoretical point of view and how I'm trying to build our uh, big data approach in Estonia uh, is that, well, three things that we can do with data we can customize and personalize that by improving quality and that gives us uh, increased effectiveness by predicting uh, what could be the result if we act in a certain way gives us improved coordination between different stakeholders and, and uh, that uh, also uh, increases efficiency and data-driven uh, discovery actually can contribute to both because there are new ways uh, of doing things. So, already today, but uh, uh, maybe not uh, entirely, but I can, I can envisi uh, envisage and, and um, the system we have started to build in Estonia rests in, on an assumption that in the future research is clinical practice, is, is, is research. So they uh, converge together. Uh, well, I think so is that actually every encounter, we don't know yet at the time when that information may become useful, but we know uh, uh, that uh, uh, it is not always just you derive your understanding what information makes sense in relation to other through hypothesis testing, but really uh, trying out a certain algorithms. So this potential value for knowledge generation comes from uh, every encounter. Currently, 
Uh, and this perhaps will be also in the future, I think, uh, less than one third of the information that has been captured uh, in healthcare can be uh, practically used uh, for, to generate new knowledge. We capture also a lot of data that we don't know what to do with. And most probably uh, it will be there. So sometimes the uh, debates are about n um, giving examples of that two thirds of the information that seems to be useless. The problem is that at the time we collect that, it's less and less uh, easy to tell when that information may become useful. Just uh, recall the example from this crazy guy from MIT who wanted to combine uh, mobile positioning data with environmental information outside, with genetic data, with uh, health behavior and, and, uh, and treatment data. And then that, and now we are entering the, the ethical terrain. So every individual, um, currently they are called in healthcare mostly patients, um, is a potential research subject and how we handle that. So now some examples of what we have done and how we are addressing that in Estonia. So what do we need? We need a lot of information from various sources powerful information system to actually process the data and then smart people um, to find the meaning from noise or random or I've just given you some beautiful fractal pictures uh, so we can find patterns uh, from noise but they always don't mean something but these things exist I would say increasingly anywhere where academic uh, research and uh, uh, activities are taking place. What I think is unique about Estonia and, and, and what I am really glad about and proud also is um, we have trust. We have trust from our people that um, if we use data by the government side or could be academic researchers or it could be also uh, private organizations, they can deliver good services and value to, uh, to citizens. Um, but this trust is, is not granted. So it, it isn't that, you know, the government will tell the people that, trust me, I'm the government. It doesn't work like way, uh, also in, in Estonia. Um, if we're talking about health data usage, one should understand that there are, there are many e-services in Estonia. Well, actually, Estonia and Finland, I think, are the two countries who have more or less officially said that uh, to, have a, to have an access to internet is, is basically a, a human right. So you shouldn't pay uh, uh, too much uh, to have your everyday food and you shouldn't pay too much to have your everyday internet. So I got very annoyed last night uh, uh, at my hotel room in Brussels when I, I, the, the internet just couldn't let me do my work the way I've, I've used to do it. So um, in order to be able to uh, provide services uh, uh, for health, uh, the environment uh, around that needs to be supported. And that is the case. That has been built over time. Uh, and that has been built around, um, um, I won't get too technical later on if somebody wants to ask, I can, I can explain, but uh, there is a um, uh, national uh, technological platform which enables secure data exchange between any uh, party, any organization, any, any database, and not just public sector. It is not dedicated for health system or health services. It is not dedicated for social services. Um, the ministry I am uh, responsible for uh, to bring in digital transformation is responsible for 45% of public budget in Estonia. So technically, we can combine all that uh, uh, information. And uh, just to show you one thing that has been uh, especially controversial is you know, e-voting. Uh, the numbers are absolute numbers, but uh, I think it has now stalled around 33, 30 to, to 35 percent of people voting electronically. Um, but it started from just uh, a small number of people. So it wasn't so that. Uh, Everybody rushed in. There, there, there was suspicious people, and there still are. And we do have uh, debates um, 
both at the parliament or in, in academic uh, research uh, um, papers or in public media about how uh, safe and useful that is. Uh, but the approach that government has taken and others is that if we can provide useful services, that is the only and best proof that data uh, can be uh, used uh, in, in, in noble purposes. And there has not been any technical uh, data breach uh, from the public system, nor uh, in uh, our health databases are connected the same way. Um, um, usually the way how the data gets uh, out to the people that shouldn't have it is uh, when some individual um, looks it and uh, not takes the whole database, just uh, sees something about uh, uh, a friend or relative and then tells to the neighbor. And that, if they tell, that cannot be controlled. But what you can control is that you can only see the data that you are entitled to. And also what we can do in Estonia and what has been done is that I as an individual can see uh, who from any public agency has accessed my data. And if I don't know why they did that, I can call and ask why this agency looked after my data, what they did with that. This happened three years ago. I, uh, I once noticed that um, uh, the police administration, uh, there was a name of the, of the police officer who had, had looked uh, my data. And I didn't recall I had any encounter with police. So I called. And then I was told that, you know, that was like seven months later, that, you know, you had speeding ticket. And then, ah, sure, it was. I paid it uh, the next day uh, and I, I had forgotten it totally. But I have this opportunity uh, to see uh, who has access my data. And then if people use, misuse that uh, opportunity, the police officer or a physician or a nurse, uh, they have been sacked from their job and also uh, being charged uh, legally uh, for that. So that is the way how the balances of uh, open society uh, and uh, uh, data-driven uh, services are built in Estonia. And uh, to end, uh, the recent uh, very practical thing we're building in Estonia and how we think uh, the big data will help our people is, I already hinted that, we are combining the genome bank which we have already since 2001. So we have already 5% of the adult population who have given their informed consent. Uh, and um, uh, we have uh, combined already for those people uh, digital health data from nine different sources. So we have 10 years of history. Uh, and if we add now uh, some investment money to that, so we are then from the government side building two things. First and foremost, it is we can't sell to the people that don't give us more data and, and we will do more research. We need to give them back something tangible, which is uh, we know a lot of personalized medicine currently is still at R&D phase, but there are already services. For instance, uh, to start with uh, personalized or, or more precise um, screening programs for breast cancer, um, or there are also some uh, uh, pharmacogenomical approaches that, that we are uh, considering. And we recently met uh, with people from Genomics England and hopefully we will build some collaboration around cancer uh, genomics as well. Um, and um, so this is as technical as I get with my lecture. Uh, so um, the clouds uh, actually imply that most probably this information uh, in the near future will be in government uh, control cloud, but in some occasions also in combined cloud with private and government um, organizations. So on the right hand side, so this red cloud is all clinical or medical information that, that you can uh, imagine. Then that goes to a personalized health information system, which we have already in Estonia. Uh, so there is uh, uh, individual information attached to the clinical information. That is being used every day for, for uh, uh, family physicians if they want to know what their patient has went through uh, in a hospital earlier times or if different specialists want to know what others have been doing 
or what prescriptions have been uh, written um, and prescribed to the person. If we pseudonymize that information, so we strip the identification uh, part, but we keep this um, um, individual uh, information organized by individuals for research uh, purposes. So we are building something, what we call basically a CERN, that then will be open and uh, possible to use by researchers or uh, product developers uh, um, in Estonia or from uh, Norwich or, or from, from other places. So it is a pool of rich information that you can test your hypothesis uh, or just dig for a, a new uh, relationship between diseases, uh, genes, environment or, or human uh, behavior. Uh, and then uh, on the left hand side you see that feeds into decision support. Remember those five areas that big data is expected to bring uh, um, uh, benefit to people. We can uh, support decisions of clinicians by deciding uh, what treatment to take or uh, what would be the next step in their diagnostic uh, uh, activities or then we can also support individuals with uh, their uh, health behavior. Um, and then how to create and keep this trust is that uh, we have uh, uh, anonymized individual patient data uh, that is informed consent based. And actually we uh, borrowed the idea uh, from our good friends in Finland we already currently have in the National Health Information System this option that individuals can give their informed consent electronically. So they can leave their medical information open for other clinicians or they can close that so uh, they don't want uh, this to be uh, used uh, for secondary purposes and they can open it up again either for this specific physician or, or in general. And we want to expand and, and, and build the system uh, more flexible uh, and with um, this idea from Finland comes that if you have given your consent to participate in an academic research, you can see then where your data has been used. It is anonymized uh, uh, at the time when it's being used, but uh, you can see which research groups have acquired access or, or uh, requested uh, um, uh, right to use your data and then you can see how many publications have been actually uh, uh, published uh, using your data, how you have been uh, contributing to um, uh, generating new knowledge. Or then you can decide whether you only want to participate in academic research or also commercially led research. So this, um, this service will be uh, quite central to, to this new platform. And what the state will have oversight on is the uh, well, infrastructure, uh, legal and ethical framework, how you get access, um, how, what are the cooperation models for academic research and for commercial research, uh, and also re-identification process uh, if uh, the researchers uh, would like then to go back to the, to the individuals. And the final slide uh, then shows just, uh, it's, it's a busy slide and, and you don't need to read all of that. Uh, I hope you will have access to the, uh, to the slides later on. The idea is that there are many opportunities and not all of them uh, uh, could be used by uh, uh, each uh, organization or individual, but uh, there, I would say, really are very little limits to what you can do and, and, and discover all of that. So, I think we can do exciting things and we can do them safely. And that's what we have been practicing last uh, 12 years in Estonia and, and uh, we have some good track record. And hopefully, if there, are, if there is interest, uh, we can uh, do some things together with our friends in uh, England as well. Thank you. It's a really radical approach that you've taken in, in Estonia. And uh, I think what we're going to do now, since our, our other speaker hasn't arrived yet, that we're going to do questions on Ain's presentation now. So uh, I'll open the floor up to questions. I'll begin first, though, actually. In, in terms of uh, the, the 
uh, issue you've raised about security of, uh, and knowledge of who's accessing your data. At least in this country, we've been exposed to a lot of breaches of data security in, in the last little while. Do, do you find that this is, is this not something that you worry about, about um, hacking of data okay. by it from, even from adventitious sources rather okay. than people, rather than officials no, wanting to know, right. access your data? So, yes, uh, the surveys that have been taken in Europe show that Estonians are among the least concerned uh, about data security. But um, if you look and read about where the breaches usually come from, they usually come from somebody you know, who have left their laptop laying around or um, memory stick being stolen. So um, there hasn't been really hacking of uh, uh, information that has been stored in, in, in government databases. We have uh, survived uh, one of the biggest uh, kind of, um, digital uh, terrorist attacks, so to say, uh, in 2007. Uh, we, we call that even a cyber war. And uh, the information wasn't uh, stolen and, and, uh, uh, and uh, technically the system has been robust. Some people claim that since it is just 1.3 million people's data, uh, there is not that much interest to get access to that. Could be true, but I can also tell you that there are uh, several layers of security why that is difficult uh, to uh, actually make use of. Uh, I, I teach that also to, to students. Uh, first, you, you store separately the clinical data and the identifiable data. So they're physically uh, kept separated. So they only connect it at the time when you do the request. Then there are um, logical uh, software rules that uh, will limit your access to the data. So if you are a physician and, and are starting looking for patient data, say exceeding uh, some, I don't know exactly, 10, 15 people uh, per uh, 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 half an hour. So the system will stop you doing that because that's not the normal pattern that you would look uh, your, your mailing data. Then you keep them in, in encrypted format. Um, and also, yeah, I mentioned already that uh, you have physically hack into the clinical data and then separately to the system which keeps your personally identifiable data. And you have to do it fast. Uh, so there are many, many layers of, of technical uh, 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 solutions that at least currently um, have been uh, able to uh, uh, deliver the promise that this trust is built on uh, and uh, we can tell that 12 years uh, of uh, experience uh, tells it is possible. So I think the question was about it, more than just the trust, it's, it's actually the, uh, the technical procurement issues that relate to acquiring these data and storing it effectively. Right. Um, first, uh, I, I again repeat, Estonia is small. Uh, so um, there is not that big money involved in, so I think uh, it is, um, well, in early this century when we started building this national uh, exchange platform, we also put out uh, international tender and then all the big guys, the Microsoft, IBM, Oracle, they, they proposed their stuff and, uh, well, we didn't have the money, so we built it on our own. Some, sometimes when you don't have money, you can do things differently. Well, currently, I think that has changed, and, and we are now working closely with also with, with commercial uh, partners. Um, but I wouldn't say that it is, it is the procurement rules that prevent people doing uh, small things. I, I still think that uh, it is people who apply those rules. Uh, and I don't think that is that much different here in England and, and in Estonia. So um, if there's will, there is way, I, I believe. And I hope will were there so I, so I can kind of support uh, him in, in, in that. So uh, uh, to paraphrase then, I think the first part, two questions. The first one was about sec security of uh, the date, data. Is that, that correct? And yeah, well, Inter and international collaborations, who owns the data, especially when you're doing commercial uh, connections. Okay.
The first question, yeah, how, how to collaborate with, uh, from a country with uh, well-guarded security and, and then partners who have uh, less sophisticated systems around that. Well, we have first example Finland, who has officially at the government level uh, decided that uh, they will use the same uh, uh, software principle. Actually, it's open software. You can download it. Uh, uh, from the, the website of our uh, state information agency. So um, how the system works uh, as such is, is not a secret, it's not a black box. I also know that the, the British government and the Estonian government have been uh, um, closely uh, discussing and this learning process uh, has been ongoing for quite some time. Uh, and then third about it is that actually there is um, what we call, the system in Estonia is called X-Road, this exchange platform. And there is X-Road for Europe. And actually the um, uh, Palestinian government is running its government business from this uh, server uh, which is built uh, by Estonia. Uh, and uh, uh, that is for outside EU. For, for, for EU countries there is, there is also basically a service. You can play around with that. So any organization who trusts the Estonian government uh, uh, built system can actually currently also uh, build their services on, on, on that uh, uh, platform. Uh, and you can apply for e-citizenship uh, in Estonia, which means that you apply for just the, the, the digital ID in Estonia. And you can do all the, you can open a company uh, and do and uh, use all those services. So there are, there are different ways at the government level, but also at the organizational level to do that. And I can tell that, that the development in, in many other countries is actually going in, in that uh, direction. But the trust building takes time. It just takes time. Uh, and uh, it's, a, it's a human issue. It's not a technological issue. Um, uh, I forgot the second question that was, it's the ownership. Of oh, the, the ownership, data. right. Um, well, we had a debate yesterday at the European eHealth Network, which is the government rep representatives um, group at the, at the commission <coughs> level. So who owns health data? In Estonia, it is owned by individual, more or less explicitly said. Uh, of course, if hospital provides you care, they have their duty to keep records, what they have been doing with you. And for that purposes, they have rights to keep that information uh, uh, for them. But I, as a citizen, have a right to tell that I want this hospital to share my data with my GP. And they cannot um, uh, deny that. And with commercial entities, uh, we are cautious. It means that any information that goes outside the government-controlled uh, area, yes, there is informed consent, but uh, it has to be um, uh, seriously informed. Uh, and uh, uh, especially with this national health information uh, system, the database, we have a dedicated uh, ethics board. Uh, if researchers would like to use that information, even if individuals have given their informed consent, there is an ethical board process, tedious one, that you have to go through uh, uh, if you want to use that data. Because it is very easy to lose the trust. Um, so again, it is not that you know, we take it for granted. There are processes uh, and, uh, and organizations built to keep that also, to maintain that. Unfortunately, again, uh, it was around 1999. We had eight years of regained independence and we had learned barely to operate in the uh, modern democratic society. 
And we had young prime minister who was brave or stupid or I don't know what. He said, I want it. And then he gathered, as I said initially, there was uh, a public tender and international companies came and, and, and put their offer on table. That, that wasn't uh, uh, affordable to us. And then uh, he said, the prime minister, Mart Lahr at that time, uh, told that, okay, all ministries will use the same platform. And, and also, we had at that time already very good collaboration with uh, the... Um, uh, uh, private sector banks, Scandinavian banks. So the banks were also interested in having this kind of uh, 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 government supported uh, uh, digital uh, infrastructure. Uh, so uh, from the day one, we had this trustworthy relationship, but you cannot you know, generate that artificially. It just happened at the right time. And, and brave politicians, of course, are always handy. The, the question was about the question of scale and whether this works correctly for Estonia because of its its scale and whether, whether that's rate limiting if we if we have bigger structures. Um, bigger thank system. you. That is a very good question. I, I don't think we know yet the answer. What I believe is that um, for Estonia uh, to tell about national system perhaps misses the point. I think what you can agree upon in, in larger countries, uh, the uh, uh, criteria for collaboration could be different than building a system for the whole country or for the whole nation. So there are uh, increasingly uh, numbers of uh, research uh, collaborative efforts where either around certain diseases, uh, these kind of big data initiatives, so bringing together data and combining that with different sources is possible. Uh, so we are already facing uh, also uh, in Estonia that uh, some of the new e-services that we launch, if we can't marry the, the uh, 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 wishes of, say, um, oncologists and cardiologists, we then go just with oncologists. If, if they are uh, they see the benefit in it uh, quicker than, than others. And that's what uh, the, the beauty of the system that we have currently is, that, that you, can, you can build services on that platform. Uh, um, you, know, you, can, you can design your service and the technology doesn't limit you uh, in the way you do. Um, one of the uh, dreams I have, uh, uh, working with my colleagues in, in Europe, is to demonstrate uh, this kind of big data collaborative uh, mm, uh, uh, well, I don't want to call it project activities uh, across countries so at least three different countries and we are uh, talking currently with uh, uh, some commission organizations and there, there is funding available and uh, yes, so part of the discussions I had yesterday with colleagues from Finland, Sweden, UK uh, was that can we build something? I know it would be difficult to start with uh, from UK. With UK we are collaborating in such a way that there is a lot of uh, uh, knowledge uh, and, and, and research activities. We can't pool yet together the data, but if we can create that opportunity among certain uh, EU member states, then maybe that kind of helps to build a trust for the citizens in this country as well. Thank you. So, so, so the question is, is, is there a, a, a global competition in big data and are, are you competing with other larger countries and organizations? Oh yes, indeed. Um, uh, there is. Currently we see our competitive advantage, uh, this societal trust. Uh, when we met a month ago with people from Genomics England, um, they have very carefully started to design the whole process in such a way that uh, um, uh, when you are uh, recruiting people, uh, to get this 100,000 individuals uh, and their genome sequence so that they, they really um, uh, do trust what you're doing. Well, we have already 50,000 and we know from a service that we can, if we would have um, 
uh, money and organization to scale it up in, in two years uh, up to 500,000. So that is our current competitive advantage. Another thing is that we have at uh, um, different levels, both academic levels uh, and, and the government levels, uh, teaming up with Finland. We had this summer um, delegation from, I think, uh, seven leading pharmaceutical companies uh, from their uh, headquarters, uh, either uh, in the United States or, or in the case of a buyer from Berlin, uh, C-level officials, and they made visits both to uh, Finland and Estonia at the same time. Uh, and uh, when I spoke about collaboration with uh, uh, Genomics England, the idea is that okay, some of the activities uh, could uh, be more attractive to be for uh, either researchers or for uh, commercial organizations um, to be taking place in, in, uh, in England here, but then testing some of those algorithms uh, at the uh, patient pool that we have in Estonia is the way how we, we collaborate. So we, this is, uh, 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 I think, what is called co-opetition. And so uh, we, we definitely uh, uh, see that uh, uh, there is a tendency towards bringing, you know, uh, trying to be the first or then the largest or whatever is uh, the, uh, the way how they promote, we promote ourselves that you can do certain things in Estonia currently, at least for the next uh, two, three years that you can't do uh, in, in other places. You paint a, a, a picture that's 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 very a, a appealing, very rosy. I, it, it, it's as if there's not been a, a limit at the moment to 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 to, to your, the acquisition and analysis of data. Do you think there is going to be a bottleneck that will will actually limit the, the things down the road? Can you well, yes, it? we have um, competing academic interests. So we have this Genome Bank, which is um, uh, currently owned by one university. The university has official contract with the government. And opening up that data and that cooperation to research groups in other universities. Uh, we have been negotiating that, and it doesn't come easy. Mm. Uh, we see a similar thing in, in, in Finland, where they have currently five different biobanks and to combine that into one national one. Um, but then also um, uh, the, uh, um, uh, we haven't put together fully the business model with uh, the commercial collaboration. Uh, we have started practical negotiations but uh, this, is, this is not sealed. So the question is uh, we, we have first contracts with those 50,000 uh, patients with some of the first pharmaceutical companies, but in order to get it a uh, nationwide solution for 500,000 and, and uh, really kind of automatic services uh, for different uh, academic or, or commercial partners, this is what we are, we are building. So we have small scale uh, examples that it can work, but of course the devil is in the details. And yes, Estonia has grown proper bureaucracy uh, and, and democratic society in the sense that if one individual takes up the case in the public media, uh, we have to deal with that. Uh, and we had prime minister two years ago who said that, well, personalized medicine is what we're going to do. And then we had one article by the CEO of the largest hospital, which was actually, he was actually afraid of some of the uh, healthcare budget being shifted away towards doing, you know, research instead of treating people. And uh, the Prime Minister backed off immediately a little bit. So in that respect, Estonia is not any different. So, so the question is about, the, the, from the patient's standpoint, how can you control the quality of the data that is inputted from, from the interface with the, the GP system, for instance? Yeah. Um, it is perhaps uh, uh, the, the biggest issue that is brought up currently by our uh, physicians. Uh, so we need to improve that. Now, um, from the patient point of view, if uh, first patient can see what the physician has been writing or, or entering about their health. So again, this transparency. 
Second is that, okay, if you immediately cannot uh, um, make up your mind whether that is uh, uh, correct or, or how that plays together with the information from other sources, okay. then from the data scientist point of view, the only way how you can actively control the quality of data is make use of the data. So if you analyze the data and give the feedback, uh, then uh, the, the uh, primary information um, uh, a source actually sees uh, the, the results and outcome of that. So controlling the data quality actually needs a um, uh, uh, feedback loop uh, from uh, later stages uh, where that information is being then used and when you can see whether the diagnosis was correct or whether all the available information was appropriately uh, used. That would be kind of two ways how I see this, this can be solved. But we haven't solved that. Uh, that definitely is what concerns uh, most current physicians. But I remember I, I told that uh, part of the information that we are collecting currently uh, can be processed through uh, 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 technological solutions even in the manner when this is incomprehensible for, uh, for humans. And uh, we, we can't put too much effort on controlling each and every piece of the information at the time when we input that. Uh, it can't be deliberately wrong, but the quality is, is a process. So the question is about informed consent. When and how is informed <coughs> consent obtained? And in particular, how, do, how is it, uh, uh, informed consent acquired in relation to children? We're entering new terrains here as well. <clears throat> when it comes to the Genome Bank in 2001, that was only addressing uh, adult population. Uh, and uh, at that time, the, the people gave, uh, that was a, an one hour of, um, they were interviewed and, and then also explained all of that. And there was public campaign. So uh, uh, at, at that moment, they gave quite broad consent uh, about uh, what could be done with the data. Um, we currently see that this is not any more enough. So that's what I told we need to build an additional layer of kind of um, informing them back how this informed consent has been used again, to support this, this initial trust. The issue with children has been raised and we are debating that. We don't have ready answer for that uh, yet. Uh, and uh, with genetic data, uh, the next layer of questions would be, okay, if you know something about somebody in the family, you actually know already a lot of information about the relatives around that. Um, so these issues are, are, are up. But uh, uh, here, again, yes, with, uh, with, uh, we were coordinating the activities with our Finnish colleagues. Uh, and they, for instance, introduced a year ago a law where um, it said that over the course, I, I think I, I can describe it correctly, so over the course of two years, there is time when you can opt out from the system that your um, uh, information will be uh, combined into this nationwide biobank and uh, uh, you have uh, to have an encounter with your uh, GP or, or other physician and to tell your consent uh, in, in, in writing and after that period of two years uh, uh, automatically your information is considered that it could be part of this uh, national system. Um, but again, that is only um, to collect and keep your data. For the secondary use of that, you still need to have uh, either uh, uh, for, uh, if it's only anonymized data, then through ethical uh, board approval, or then also they are building the similar um, additional informed consent, for instance, if for commercial purposes you want to use that data. So the question is, how, how do you know you're getting the right data for the right decisions, the right clinical decisions? Well, me personally, I wouldn't know 
I trust experts here. Um, but I, perhaps I would have to answer the same way as I, as I answered before, that uh, um, we start from somewhere uh, and then we make use of the data as much as possible and then we try to do corrections quickly enough. Um, at this very clinical level in the, in the hospital or then through uh, research uh, projects as well. But here I think increasingly, uh, and, the, and uh, for instance our Genomics England is, is building a very smart approach I would say. They, they are crowdsourcing that knowledge. So they are uh, expecting to bring in uh, at least uh, uh, 150, I believe, specialists on each clinical domain to work with the data uh, and uh, to try to uh, uh, um, interpret the findings and then give back uh, guidance and suggestions uh, what, what to change in that. So uh, similarly, uh, using uh, people's uh, collaboration. So the question is about the digital culture in Estonia. There seems to be a high take up of the, of the digital culture. How has that achieved? How, how has it happened? As I, as I mentioned, it was started in a, in a true public-private partnership. The largest banks that, uh, that we have, uh, uh, that we had at that time, I think they trained with their own money, I think 15% of the population, mostly elderly people, to use computers. And then they set up um, in the public libraries uh, um, open uh, computer spaces with then uh, people that could assist elderly people to do their uh, bank transfers or, uh, or uh, file their taxes. And that was repeated uh, once again. Uh, and actually we know that we perhaps should uh, repeat that again because there are more sophisticated services now. That just do your bank transfer or file taxes. Estonia has relatively simple tax system. Uh, um, but uh, uh, it, it uh, is something that private organizations actually have understood that it is their benefit if uh, people are digitally competent. Great, well, thank you very much, Jane. Um, I think that's, that's been a wonderful presentation and it's a really eye-opener to see how things are, are going so fantastically well in the digital era in Estonia. And we wish you all great success for the future. Thank you, and I hope we give you some courage yes. you know, to demand we more. Will. more. <laughs> we can do it. So